So thank you all for coming and for joining us tonight. Like Sonia said, I'm originally French and I will accept all questions in French, of course, and in English. So we can have a very international um, uh, session tonight about symbiosis and some, maybe not so much what we are doing right now in the lab, but a bit more a general thing about what is symbiosis and why do we use, why do we study it and why do we use it uh, in everyday life, uh, potentially without knowing it. So microbial symbiosis, let me, I don't study this on my own. Like Sonia said, I have a team with me and <clears throat> the group is called Insect Symbiosis, Ecology and Evolution. We are funded by the Academy of Finland, and we, um, I had also previously some funding from the uh, European Research Council, um, so Marie Curie uh, Fellowship. And we are based at the University of Helsinki, so if you ever want to visit the Viki campus, uh, I'll be happy to give you a small tour of our facilities if you want to. So we study microbial symbiosis, and we aim to integrate that research, well, it's we also have collaborators, um, international collaborators that help us with that research. But yeah, like I said, we study microbial symbiosis and we want to integrate it into the teaching um, through the students that are joining the group and also the different lectures um, that we are uh, providing at the university. But also through, like today, outreach uh, event. Um, so this is my little boy <laughs> who was year, here a few years ago for another presentation. Um, so we, it's important that our research reach the public. So thank you again for coming today. And why do we um, study symbiosis? Because it has implication for health, agriculture, and it can provide some solution for some of the problems that we are facing nowadays, especially in the, um, in the face of climate change and um, other um, problems that we, can, um, we know about at the moment. So let me tell you what first is, what are microbial symbiosis? What is symbiosis? So, Microbial symbionts are microbes, and this includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, some eukaryotic microorganisms, anything that we could um, pretty much see under the microscope. Um, they are on or inside the body of the host, or even within the cell of, uh, of the host. So it could be me, you, your dog, cat, the birds outside, we had also plants um, and other eukaryotic um, uh, organism. And their relationship, so our relationship with those microbes is a long-term relationship. Their transmission is through generation. We will, or insects, in, which I will talk about a lot tonight, insects will transmit um, these symbionts to their offspring to their to the next um, generation of insects and um, they, manip they can manipulate the host phenotype so um, how does a host behave how does uh, how many eggs uh, insect produce how many um, uh, sorry how far an insect can disperse can manipulate all those phenotypes in many different ways but the goal of those manipulation is to benefit the symbionts, not specifically to benefit the host. So it can range, their relationship can range from parasitic all the way to mutualistic. And in, when we talk about symbiosis, we are not really considering infectious um, microbes. So I wouldn't consider the COVID virus to be a symbiont, but it's an infection. Oh yeah, so this, this, sorry, so this is supposed to go with the, it manipulates their host um, phenotype to their own benefit. So through time and through generation, the, gener the um, population of blue mosquitoes, which carry a symbionts, would actually um, replace the population of um, 
mosquitoes that is not infect, infected by the symbionts. I will give you some example uh, later on. So in general, microbes are ubiquitous. You are a host, like I said before, and um, you have about 30 trillion um, human cells. And you also carry, depending on the research that you're reading, about one and a half time to 10 times more of microbes. And many of them are actually on your skin, but also inside your gut. And those would be considered um, symbionts. So today, tonight, I'm going to give you just a few examples, and these include uh, different relationships. We're going to talk about a nest protector, so a symbiont that can protect the nest of this host, a male killer, a symbiont that kills the son of um, infected mothers, a light producer, a cover maker, a growth booster, um, a disease competitor, and an e energy provider. And you will have the chance to discover more examples through the app, the Street Science app that we're going to present a little bit later. And there are some posters uh, uh, across the room that you can scan with the app too, to have some description of those different symbioses. But if you have any question during the talks, just don't hesitate to, to ask them. All right, let's go with the first example, a nest protector. So this beautiful little insect that is here, let me see, can you see? Yeah, um, is, is actually um, a wasp. It's called the bee wolf uh, wasp. And it is known to be in association with, this, um, with a type of uh, streptomyces bacteria. Um, and this bacterium is protecting the nest of this wasp against um, another pathogen. So the ecology of the wasp first. So the wasp lay eggs, so it actually flies around and digs in the, in the ground, and then it catch a bee. Sorry, where is my... Here. <laughs> I don't see it on my screen. So it catch a bee, kills the bee, and put the bee body, the dead bee, in the nest, uh, which is underground. And then with its antenna, the, bee, the wasp, so this little, sorry, this little uh, insect here, starts to move its antenna like this on the, the, um, the walls of the, of the nest, so where it deposited this uh, dead bee. And then something white is coming out of the antenna, so it starts to come out of this antenna as it moves it on the, on the wall of the nest. And researchers from um, uh, Martin's group have um, found out that this white secretion is actually the bacterium um, streptomyces. So we can see uh, streptomyces bacteria uh, all here. And what they have shown is that if the wasp is not allowed to actually do this on the wall of the nest, the bee starts to be infected with this soil fungus because in the soil, I mean, your mom probably told you, wash your hand once you've uh, played in the mud and everything. It's because there are lots of bacteria in the mud, but there's also fungus. And so if the bee, if the wasp is not allowed to, to secrete those bacteria, this is how the bee ends up. And this is not good for the egg that the wasp will lay on that dead bee because the fungus will kill uh, the egg. But if the wasp is allowed to do this, that fungus never grows. And then the wasp can lay its eggs and the little wasp can eat that dead bee and survive and develop into an adult wasp. So what the researchers have found is that this is all due, the protection against the fungus is because of the bacterium. The bacterium is secreting an antifungal compound that doesn't allow the soil fungus to grow on the dead bee and thus protect the wasp baby against this pat pathogen fungus. All 
All right, so let's talk about male killer now. <laughs> um, so there are many examples actually of male killer in nature, and I'm gonna just talk about one in the ladybug, but for my PhD, I studied one in a butterfly. Um, so, and there are some in Drosophila flies. Um, yeah, very diverse insect host can be infected by male killer. So in the case of the lady, the ladybug, the bacterium that cause male killer, male killer, sorry, is, um, is called cardinium. So how does male killer work? So we have here a female um, that is infected by the, the symbionts, uh, cardinium male killer, and it will lay, let's say, 100 eggs. 50 of those eggs will be females, and 50 of those eggs will be males. They will all be infected by the bacterium, but only the female, the daughter, will survive. All the males will be killed. And this, at first, is just like, well, after a while, there is only females, so how does the host um, reproduce? That is not, that's not so sustainable in the long term. And you would be correct. It, in the long term, if the bacterium spreads in the whole population and we end up with only females, there is a risk for the ladybug to actually go extinct. And there is no way they can mate, there is no way they can fertilize their eggs, um, they will all die. But you have to remember, for the bacterium, it is selfish, so it doesn't care about its host. It just wants to be transmitted to the next generation and to do better at the next generation. So the more it's spread in the population, the more it's successful. But furthermore, so in the uninfected ones, we have the life cycle here. So the female will lay eggs, they will turn into uh, larvae, and then they will pupate, and then there will be um, a new generation. In the infected ones, we have the females laying the same amount of eggs, um, but then 50 of them as males, they will die, and there will be only um, females. But those females will be a lot bigger, like fatter. And this is because in that particular species, the ladybug, they eat each other. They are cannibalistic. So the eggs that actually die here, they will be eaten by their sisters that are surviving. So the sisters that come out of their eggs, um, they have a very, very easy, um, nutritious um, dinner <laughs> just as soon as they come out. And then they can just feed, gorge themselves on those dead brothers and then um, become bigger. And a bigger ladybug means the next generation more eggs. And of course, again, they will die. 50% will die because they are brothers. And those females will be, again, bigger and they will lay more eggs. And those eggs are always infected by the bacteria. So this is the benefit. The infected population will have bigger eggs, more transmission, and then through the generation, we will see more and more infected ladybugs. Yes, please. I had a question. So is it always 50% male and 50% uh, women? So maybe I should repeat the question. The question is, is it always 50% males, 50% females? Well, this is theoretically, that's how it should work. Because those insects, they are just like, um, um, the, they, sh they should reproduce 50 males, 50 females. Um, but there are definitely some species that tend to be more towards females, a bit more towards males. Um, it depends on the... But theoretically, we should see in those insects about 50% males, 50% females. But, I mean, when I do experiment, if I always have 50-50, I'm, <laughs> I'm very lucky, <laughs> yes. All right, so let's change from insect now and move on to another um, symbiosis. And in this case, we are looking at this beautiful animal, which is a squid, a bobtail squid. 
and um, the symbionts, it's another bacterium, it's called Alibrio, Alivibrio fisheri. Um, I will call it Vibrio um, for tonight. So the relationship between um, the squid and the bacterium, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite beautiful. Um, so the bacterium, in that case, can survive in the environment, so in the water, without being inside the host. So it doesn't have to be always associated with the host. And so what we observe here, so this graph here, what it shows, so this is a daytime, this is a nighttime, and then the next daytime, and the next nighttime. So what happened? <coughs> the squid during the day is very shy. It hides in the sand, so here you, you can't really see it, but it is, um, it is hidden in the sand. And what it does during that, um, that time in the sand, it just filters the water. And by filtering the water, it is collecting uh, Vibrio bacteria from the water. So that, that's what this line is representing. So through the day, it is collecting the Vibrio bacterium. And so when nights come, its organ, where it stores the bacterium, is full. And then during the night, this animal is active and it hunts uh, fish during the night, so in the water column. But this is an animal that is also a prey to other um, bigger fish than itself. And um, it finds a way to protect itself or to camouflage itself um, by actually associating itself with the uh, Vibrio, because Vibrio is, a, is able to uh, produce bioluminescence. So you have to imagine you are a squid in the water columns, it's dark because it's night, but there is the light of the moon um, above, above you. If you are black, the light of the moon will make you very visible from predators from outside because you are black against the shiny light of the moon. But if you are producing bioluminescence, you become invisible to the, to the, light, to the predators that are behind, under you because you are the same color than the moon. So the Vibrio Producing the bioluminescence make the, bio, the squid less visible and less uh, predated upon um, by predators, by bigger fish. And then comes the day. You don't want to be flashy bioluminescent during the day because then the predators will be able to also see you. So then the squid release all in, at once all the bacteria again in the water and go hide in the sun, in the sand, sorry, and then during the day filters a new batch of, um, of uh, bacteria. So the benefit for the squid is protection against uh, predators. The benefit for the bacterium is that the squid will move during the day and then the bacterium will be dispersed um, to another area where it could probably reproduce, uh, multiply and um, and survive the new environment. So one cool fact about Vibrio is that it can survive in the water column, but you can also uh, rear it, like multiply it, <laughs> in um, on petri dish. And people have started to make art out of these. So they just um, spread a little bit of the bacteria, turn off the light, and then the all the um, the bacteria turns on its bioluminescence activity and it can be visible under the, uh, in the dark light. So, um, so you, can, you can ask researchers, I don't think in Helsinki anybody is doing this yet, but it could be something, some activities for, oops, for, um, for schools, uh, children or anything. Yeah. All right, is there any particular question, any thing that I need to clarify so far? How release the, this bacteria? Sorry? How release this bacteria from the body? Tell told me as that during day. Yes, so the the so the squid has a special organ, so um, it has this filter organ and inside towards behind the, the stomach it has 
um, like an organ to store. So it filters it, it stores the bacteria here, only that bacteria can be in that organ. And then when the day comes, it just contracts and then everything is exposed from, the, from that organ. Okay, let's talk about, let's go back to insects, because that's what I study mostly, and um, that's what I find mostly fascinating as well. So, we have here a cover maker. So let me go through that. Can I? Oh, I always get the wrong way. I'm lost with my, my mouse, sorry. Yes, here, okay. So this particular beetle here can be either light color or dark color. And it is light color when the symbionts with what it is associated, which is a bacterium again, uh, is absent. And it is black color, not darker color, when the symbionts is present. So, and, uh, and here this, um, this graph is showing you the melanization level in those um, light orange um, beetles and in blue it's the dark orange beetles. So we can clearly see that there is more melanin in the dark colored beetles than there is in the uh, light colored beetles. And here what researchers have done, they have actually looked at how thick is the cuticle, so the skin, the exoskeleton of those insects. And in the case of the light orange, so the left one, their cuticle is actually rather thin um, compared to the dark colored um, beetles, where their cuticle is much thicker. And this is because the symbionts is providing amino acids to the beetles and this amino acid, the beetle is using them to produce this extra, um, this extra cuticle and thus this extra um, darker colors. And there are many examples similar to that one. So we have this kind of little beetle, uh, sorry, I don't remember the name of the beetle, but it's also um, a similar mechanism happens in weevils. It, what's the name? It, ca, casca, chanson, but in Finnish it's cascara, cascaras, caras, chanson. Sorry? Cascas. Cascas, yes, something like this. Yeah. So it's the, it's those little, it's very common. You find them ev almost everywhere. And when you have them in your kitchen, you start to worry that your food is contaminated, so you don't want them inside the kitchen. Um, so in that particular species and in many of the weevils, we have a similar symbiosis between a bacterium, in that case it's called um, sodalis, and those species. And what happens, um, the amino acid again <laughs> is produced by the bacterium and the host, the insect, is using that amino acid to make its cuticle very strong. So I have a personal story about, um, about this. So I was at a conference a few years ago, uh, as a, I think I was still a PhD student or a young postdoc, and this professor from Japan comes in the, to give his talk about this particular association. And he says that he went in his lab and he was talking with these students and the students were like, we took the, the symbionts away and the, the weevils are very, very strange. And it's just like, okay, show me. And the students show the, stu the, the weevil and then the professor is like, oh yeah, it's, it's quite strange, it's like wrinkly. And then it starts to press it and it's like smashed it in his finger. And it's like, oh, okay, there's something wrong. And then he takes the weevil with the symbionts inside that hasn't been traumatized by any antibiotic treatment, and then he goes, ah! Yeah. <laughs> and he was not able to squeeze the weevil the same way. It was impossible to break the weevil. They have, it's quite big species in Japan, it's like this. 
and he was just like trying hard and hard and he never was able to break the weevil because it was so strong but then when the surveillance was gone it was just like mush in his hand I jumped like you did during the conference <laughs> it really woke me up yeah, yeah. only to say that in Finnish it's Karsakas Karsakas, yes yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but those association between the symbiont and the weevil are very old. So this is something that has been going on for millions of years. And many of the associations I already talked about um, before are very similar, very old association. And in the weevil is um, especially astonishing because this very long term relationship has led to the weevil developing some organs just to store, just like the, the squid before had this organ specialized for storing the symbionts, the, the weevils have also those particular chamber along their gut microbiome, their, their gut um, uh, tube to actually only store that, um, that sodalis bacterium. So all the green you see here is the bacterium sodalis, so many, many bacterium, and the blue is actually the host cells that are doing, um, deli doing the limit of those, <coughs> of those little chambers. Yes. So, maybe, why does it matter at this point to study this kind of relationship? So it becomes very clear in the case of those particular beetles because they are actually pests for our agriculture, for our food, for our kitchens. They destroy the rice. Um, so those, like you can see here, that particular weevil is attacking uh, mice, like corn. Um, and these uh, particular beetles, they live in flour. So in the, um, what you use to make your pulla, I would say flour, flour, yeah, um, la farine. <laughs> Um, so they can really cause a lot of um, trouble, but also some weevils um, can um, kill trees. So if there is too many of them, um, there is a lot of um, damage to forestry, uh, like I mentioned here. So more than 100 million euros of damage in Europe, um, in the forest of Europe, caused by some of those uh, insects. 270 millions um, of euros in the uh, cattle pasture because they can also destroy the root of um, the grass and that cows and sheep are feeding on so in New Zealand it's a very big problem or um, or another example of forest but it's it's really a global problem so by understanding symbiosis uh, we can target the symbiont so use some kind of antibiotic um, to be able to kill the symbionts and without the symbionts, they don't have that hard cuticle, they are more easily preyed upon by other insects, or they die uh, easier of um, desiccation, so they lose their own water a lot faster. So it's, it's allowing us to control those populations a lot better. Okay, I have like a couple more examples. Um, another one that you might have heard about um, Plants, legumes associate with bacteria from the soil. Um, in that case, we call we talk about uh, rhizobia. Uh, so they are very common in the soil. They can live in the soil without the plant, but when the plant accepts them, it starts to build those little organs here that we uh, we see and we call root nodules, and they start to be exchanged between the plant and the bacteria such that the bacteria produce nitrogen that the plant use for growth. So in that particular picture here, we have plants of the same age. So those four plants of the same age. Those two have never been in contact with rhizopia bacteria, but those two have, and they are much, much bigger. So they are getting a lot of nutrition from the bacteria. So similar to the weevil, that we can use the bacterium against the weevil to control the pest, in that case, we can provide those bacteria to extra fertilizer to make um, bigger uh, legumes production, so increase production of the plants. 
let's go back to insects again. <laughs> so this is actually the bacteria that um, Federica is working with um, and um, Camilla is encountering that bacteria quite a lot in her uh, studies as well. So Wolbachia is um, it's a bacterium. It's present in 40% of all insect species across the world. So it's one of the most successful microorganisms or organisms around the world. And um, it was it was shown to um, it was shown to be absent in insect in um, in uh, mosquitoes for some reason. Some mosquito species don't seem to carry uh, Wolbachia. So researchers started to play and they injected Wolbachia into the eggs of mosquitoes and they were able to get mosquitoes with Wolbachia. And what they realized is that when the mosquito has Wolbachia, they can't transmit dinghy, they can't transmit Zika, they can't transmit chikungunya. There, there is something happening where the same, the brothers or the sisters of those mosquitoes without Wolbachia they do still transmit um, those diseases. And what happens is that Wolbachia and those virus, such as dinghy, they compete for some nutritious element within the mosquitoes, but Wolbachia wins, such that the virus can't replicate, but the Wolbachia is still there. So Wolbachia is helping us human fight dinghy or Zika across the world. So this was discovered about in 2008, and now they have there's this um, this program, the World Mosquito Program, that has developed across the world and is releasing millions of mosquitoes every year in the wild. And um, and for example, this is the case in um, I think it's Townsville in Australia. So before before they started releasing the mosquitoes with Wolbachia there was a lot of outbreaks of dinghy and lots of people were getting on a regular basis very sick. In 2010 they started to release those mosquitoes with Wolbachia and since then they have not had a single outbreak of dinghy in that area. So the population of mosquitoes, because Wolbachia has spread in the whole population, has been able has been replaced from Wolbachia non-infected mosquitoes to Wolbachia infected mosquitoes that are not able to transmit dinghy. And um, in Brazil, in um, Vietnam, in Cambodia, uh, they are starting to see the same trend with their local uh, mosquitoes population. So this is a very successful story. Yeah. Uh, how they, we are sure that the bacteria will be dangerous for us later? Like. So, because a lot of examples and we start to uh, introduce new species in yeah. also. So we have been in contact with Wolbachia, so because Wolbachia is in 40% or more of all insect species in the world, and we have been in contact with other insects and we have not um, contracted a Wolbachia uh, disease. So Wolbachia is only found in insects, in nematodes and in some other arthropods. It has never been found in mammals, uh, so it, it, there is no threat um, at the moment for, well, I don't think there will ever be a threat from the bacteria. Yeah. All right, one more example. I'm talking about an energy um, provider. So we have, um, we are in symbiosis. We are in symbiosis with our gut microbiota, but also our own origin is based on a symbiotic event where a bacterium cell was actually engulfed by a bigger cell to create eukaryotes, to create our complicated uh, eukaryotic cells our, um, that brought um, all the animals on earth, all the plants on earth. So this is just to show you a um, long, long time ago, um, these large cells 
uh, engulf either um, an archaea that became um, a, um, a mitochondria or a bacteria that became the chloroplast. And these produce now what we call uh, plant cells and these are uh, animal um, cells. So we are, <laughs> yeah, um, symbiosis is really at the origin of our life uh, in a way. So I just wanted to mention um, this particular example.